She dropped 106 pounds on The Biggest Loser, but that wasn't the hard part. Amy Parham shares how she lost the weight and kept it off on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Japan endured the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki when the United States dropped nuclear bombs on them. Devastating. Well, <clears throat> it looks like they're having a repeat up there in the Sendai area in northern Japan. The U.S. government is warning that the nuclear situation in Japan is getting worse. It's telling Americans there to get at least 50 miles away. I don't know exactly what happens if there's a meltdown, but they think there's not water on those rods and containment ponds. I, I don't know enough about it, and it looks like the experts are, are conflicted. Terry? Well, the Japanese government is trying to cool the reactor from the air before it releases more radiation. Heather Sells has the story. Helicopters are now dumping seawater into holes on the roof of damaged reactor number three hoping to cool overheated uranium fuel. Just yesterday, the Japanese considered this procedure to be too dangerous, but the U.S. insisted that something be done. We're reminded of how American leadership is critical to our closest allies, even if those allies are themselves economically advanced and powerful. There are moments where uh, they need our help. Experts are now saying the 180 emergency workers at the plant may be on a suicide mission. There is hope that Tokyo Electric will be able to get power lines knocked out by the earthquake back online. That could restore the plant's cooling system and ease the crisis. In the meantime, the State Department is sending aircraft to help Americans evacuate northeast Japan. And Tokyo's airport is packed with people trying to get out. This 15-year-old was sent by her parents to stay with family in the U.S. So there was the earthquake, and then there's the radiation, and my parents kind of freaked out. So they wanted me to come and then go to my aunt's house, so I'll be safe. The question of safety right now is confusing for many with differing assessments from the U.S. and Japan. The U.S. is warning its citizens to stay at least 50 miles away from the plant, but the Japanese government is only advising a 12-mile safety zone. This man says it is worrying that Japanese and U.S. criteria are different, and I feel a bit doubtful about our judgment. Heather Sells, CBN News. Well, it could be a great tragedy if that thing, those rods melt down, and, and uh, there could be a serious release of radiation. We don't know how extensive whether 50 miles will do it, but uh, many people are just totally evacuating. The French, you know, they have Oriva is the big company that builds nuclear power plants. The French have ordered all of their people to evacuate. They're out of Japan. So we'll see. Well, we're not leaving. We're going in. And Operation Blessing is on the ground providing aid to the victims. David Darg is very close to the earthquake's epicenter in the Sendai area. Operation Blessing is distributing food and water to some of the 6,000 people left homeless in the area by the disaster. David filed this video report from one of the hardest hit areas. The volunteers behind me are cooking meals to serve some of the thousands of displaced families in this city alone. There are 6,000 people estimated to have lost their homes in this city and they still haven't accounted for all the missing. They don't even know how many people are missing here. The city water supply has been cut off and the people really, really need water. So Operation Blessing brought water supplies from Tokyo. We brought food, we've delivered it here. And we've met with the leadership of the city. We've talked about how Operation Blessing can continue to support efforts here and really bolster this type of scenario. There's lots of this going on in the region, feeding centers that have been set up to serve the victims of the disaster. And Operation Blessing can provide a supply chain of food, supplies, and water to this type of feeding center. This building is full of families that have come to take refuge. Uh, these are people that have been displaced from their homes. And you can see, if you look in here, families have just taken over classrooms. We're going to start serving this place as much as we can because there are not just this school, there are many centers throughout this city that really need food, that really need water, and really need our help. Well, as I mentioned yesterday, we're trying to uh, <clears throat> rent a, a, a oil 
tanker truck with kerosene so we can give to kerosene to the people who need it. It's freezing cold up there. It's cold in Sendai. It's snowing, and uh, the people are without heat, and many of them without water. And so we're trying to do what we can, and the word was that the Japanese really don't need any money. Well, apparently they do, because, you know, there are only so many hands and feet that can deliver these supplies. And Operation Blessing, as I understand, was the first international uh, non-governmental organization to come in to help them. <clears throat> if you want to help this crisis, it's 1-800-758, excuse me, 759-0700, um, Disaster Relief Fund, CBN Center, or you can give us a call. And um, I think your, your help is needed urgently. We're always on the scene where people are hurting. Lee Webb has the rest of our top stories. Lee? Matt, the situation in Japan has raised the question of nuclear safety in this country, especially in areas where earthquakes are more common. Mark Martin takes a look at the measures in place to protect those communities. When you look at the mind-boggling images from Japan, it's no wonder people are concerned about the safety of nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. It can get up to 550 degrees Fahrenheit. Richard Zerker manages nuclear public affairs for Dominion, the owner of the Surrey nuclear power station in southeast Virginia. Surrey has two of the 104 operating nuclear reactors in the United States, which supply 20% of the country's electricity. Zerker has been fielding a lot of calls in light of what's happening in Japan, but he maintains that Surrey is safe. Safety in the nuclear industry in the United States is a real success story. The stations are very safe. The Three Mile Island was the, uh, the wake-up call to the industry. There was, there's been a lot of thought into what happened there. We view nuclear energy as a, a very important component to the overall portfolio we're trying to build for a, a clean energy future. However, at least 22 of the nuclear reactors at American power plants are located in earthquake danger zones, including an area in the center of the country, the infamous New Madrid seismic zone. Still, the chairman of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission says U.S. plants are prepared. All our plants are designed to withstand significant natural phenomena like earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, and tsunamis. A containment building is one of the protective measures used here at Surrey and at other nuclear power plants around the country and world. Here is a model of one. Containment buildings consist of massive steel reinforced concrete walls that are around four and a half feet thick. And you can see inside the containment building, you'll find the nuclear reactors. The concrete domes you see at the Surrey power station are the containment buildings. They protect the entire nuclear power generation system. Zerker says the nuclear industry and other experts believe these structures provide protection from not only nature's fury, but also terrorist attacks. They contend that these containment buildings can probably withstand an impact from a large jetliner. Officials say another line of defense is the pumping station, like this one at a plant in Michigan. It's the water source that cools down reactors in an emergency, about 900 gallons per minute. Other safety features include a 30-foot seawall at this nuclear plant in California to protect against tsunamis. And back in Virginia at the Surrey Power Station, barriers have been installed to prevent flooding in the event of a hurricane. The bottom line is we will, as a nuclear industry in the United States, go over with a fine-tooth comb what happened in Japan, and we will glean every lesson that we can, and we will make sure that the reactors in this country, which are already safe, can even be more safe. The crisis in Japan, though, where explosions likely cracked critical containment buildings, has critics questioning if a nuclear plant can ever be built strong enough to survive certain danger zones. Mark Martin, CBN News, Surrey County, Virginia. Pat, of course, these are legitimate questions to ask, but with the media so laser focused on this crisis, do you think that, that, that we tend to overreact to things like this? There's no question about it. You know, there's a new technology that's just being brought into to bear, especially in China, that's called Pebble Bed, that's even safer than what they're using now. But these ones, uh, in the reactors in, uh, in Japan are 20 years old. They're an older technology. And even under those circumstances, it looks like this stuff is going to be contained. I feel it will be. But in terms of pollution, in terms of air quality, in terms of expense, 
a nuclear power is without question the way to go. And what we ought to do is focus on how do we make it safe as possible instead of just saying, let's, let's abandon it and go to some wind farm. There isn't enough wind. There isn't enough solar. There isn't enough biomass to take care of the needs of our nation and of the world. And we've just got to keep working on nuclear until we get it right. But I, I don't think that it's that kind of a danger here in America. And the, Japan is on a major earthquake fault. They have like 1,400 tremors a year in Japan, just regularly. And so when you build nuclear power plants where you know that there's a danger of tsunami and danger of earthquakes, you're going to have some problem. But here in America, it's not the same thing. And I, I hope that our government will not overreact. And if possible, the industry can get even safer than it currently is at home. Lee? Pat, the Israeli Navy says it's clear that Iran is still in the business of arming terrorists. Israel intercepted a ship this week with 50 tons of weapons on board thought to be bound for the Gaza Strip. Julie Stahl has that story. These weapons began their journey in Iran, were loaded onto a ship in Syria and headed to Egypt. From there, Israel believes they were to have been smuggled into the Gaza Strip. They were en route to the terror organizations in Gaza. But their ultimate target was Israel's civilian population. We've already sustained tens of thousands of rockets, missiles, mortar shells that were fired at our citizens. Some of the weapons seized from the Victoria were on display here in the port in Ashdod. For the first time, one of these shipments included what Israel called a strategic weapon. I'm talking about the C-704-6 missiles that are short to sea uh, with a range of 35 kilometers manufactured in China, and uh, we know that Iran also has it. Known as the Nasser-1, this cruise missile carries a 300-pound warhead, which would have given terrorists the ability to threaten civilian and military vessels off the Gaza coast. Hidden behind bags of lentils, the shipment included 74,000 bullets and 2,000 mortar shells. Any bomb here, even the mortar shells here, which is 60 millimeters, can kill. So we are seeing one big container of terror. This is the fourth time in a decade Israel has intercepted a weapons ship possibly bound for Gaza. Israeli commandos requested and received permission to board the cargo ship Victoria as seen in this army video. Some question if Iran dropped off the weapons when it recently sent ships through the Suez Canal. I can only say that chronologically the Iranian warships uh, have uh, visited Syria, and only then the ship was loaded. No matter how and when it happened, this weapon seizure is a clear reminder that Iran is actively building up its allies against Israel. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Ashdod Port, Israel. What a shipment there, Pat. I mean, when you think about tactical weapons, like small arms and mortars, they're bad enough. But when you're talking about those strategic rockets, that's quite another thing. Well, a, a cruise missile, you, you know, Lee, I've been over there so many times, and I was there during that uh, last war. Uh, there are about 40,000 uh, rocket launchers in southern Lebanon, and uh, Hezbollah was launching uh, recklessly. Uh, you could see places where missiles had hit down in Haifa and other places parts, certainly up in the northern Galilee area. And uh, it, it's, you realize how vulnerable Israel is. Israel is a tiny little country. And they used to talk about defensible borders, but there are no defensible borders to a rocket. Rocket goes right over top of the borders. And the fact that I think it was a major strategic mistake to give Gaza up. Uh, the former prime minister of Israel did it. and. Uh, uh, it, it has proved nothing but a heartache, and, and they had a so-called free election that our government applauded, and then they elected a terrorist organization, Hamas, that is running Gaza, and Gaza is right chock-a-block next to Israel. And those settlers that live close by are under uh, rocket attacks. They, what is the Qassam rocket, I believe? They're short range, but nothing like what they're bringing in now which means that Iran is trying to destroy Israel, and Israel has got to take whatever steps are needed to defend itself. And I think the world community has got to realize that this little nation has every right to exist, and it has every right to defend itself. 
We've got some good news, by the way, from Haiti. The American Center for Law and Justice got busy and something good happened. Lee? Pat Haiti has released an American missionary in prison for more than five months. Danny Pye had worked in Haiti for about eight years. In October, authorities threw him in jail because of a property dispute down there. That dispute was settled, but officials held him without explanation or any formal charges. Last week, though, his wife contacted attorneys for the American Center for Law and Justice. They met with the Haitian ambassador and State Department officials. Pye was released and is planning now to return to his home in Florida. Good news, Pat. Well, I hope he will now stay in Florida and not go back to Haiti. Yeah, wow. But we're there. Because you know, the, I think he was doing some wonderful work there. Of course he was. Well, the American Center for Law and Justice is there to help people in whatever country, in whatever situation. And that's just, uh, I'm so excited about it. Well, it's political season. You know, it's not very long before they go start those primaries. Oh, the games have begun. Oh, <laughs> the games yes. have begun. Right. Well, up next, presidential hopefuls firing the first shots in the race for the White House. I love what you stand for. I want to listen to the people of Iowa. Now, America's in trouble. If you want a European secular socialist, you have a great incumbent president. We need to be a country that's turning towards God, not away from God. Go behind the scenes at the evangelical primary. Plus, got a question for Pat? Let us know. Log on to CBN.com and head to our chat room, and we're going to bring it online with your questions later on today's show. Attention investors, now is the time to protect your retirement accounts and investments. Excessive government spending is devaluing the U.S. dollar, and high rates of inflation are coming. Gold has tripled since 2001, and some experts predict the prices will climb another 100%. Buy gold now, direct and wholesale, with United Gold Group. The demand for gold around the world is higher than ever. Foreign countries like China and India are buying up gold at record rates. Why? What do they know that you don't? Call now and get your Gold Investor's Kit absolutely free. Call in the next five minutes and receive the secret to owning gold in your retirement account also absolutely free just call 1-800-758-5070 that's 1-800-758-5070 this could be the most important call you make this year united gold group investing in america's future tomorrow from a former soviet gulag a prison camp prayer Today, we are seeing the fruits of their prayers. That's changing a nation. These tribes were once forgotten, not anymore. Plus, he's one of the most popular chefs in the country who started some of the most popular restaurants in the world. Rick Tremonto shows you how to get a five-star meal at home tomorrow on The 700 Club. Politics. You know, everybody focuses on Iowa. Do you know what happens during the caucuses in Iowa? How many people turn out? Oh, I I can't imagine. I mean, it's not a heavily... Well, it's a three million population mm -hmm. state. How many of those care about the Republican or Democratic primaries? Well, I don't know. Well... You've been there. Give I've been the there. <laughs> the answer is about 100,000. And there are less people showing up at the caucuses than go to the high school basketball playoffs. Well, basketball is big in Iowa. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. I mean, we make such a big deal out of yes. it. But, you know. Uh, well, sort of the leaping off point. I mean, don't yeah. you think people are looking at it almost like we look to the groundhog well, for when Jimmy Carter won, won Iowa, it was viewed as a big deal. He mm -hmm. went on from there to, to the big morning shows, and he started racking An up. An indicator, stuff. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but now it's a little different. When, when, after my race in, in 88, uh, I came in second, but everybody considered it a big win uh, in Iowa because we mobilized the Christians, mm -hmm. and the Christians are very strong in Iowa. And... Uh, so right now, there was something called the Faith and Freedom uh, Foundation or whatever it is that uh, Ralph Reed organized. And um, it took from the old Christian coalition, which I formed, and uh, they had a big uh, meeting out there. And the guys are looking, if you're going to win Iowa, you've got to take the evangelical vote. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's important. You go to New Hampshire, forget it. But uh, down in Iowa, it's a, it's a big thing. So uh, the 2012 presidential race is underway. And potential candidates are visiting the primary states. And as David Brody reports, many of them are competing directly 
for that all-important evangelical vote, at least in Iowa. Political rule number one in Iowa, if you want to win the presidential caucus, court the evangelicals. We have people in Washington, D.C. who believe the unborn do not have a right to life. Yes, they do. Five expected presidential contenders took their first opportunity to reach that audience at the recent Faith and Freedom Coalition event north of Des Moines, Iowa. They received a stark message. My message to the National Republican Party tonight is real simple. If you turn your backs on the pro-family, pro-life constituency and on the values that they stand for, you will be consigned to permanent minority status. A long line of hopefuls is expected to compete for those votes. Tim Pawlenty, Rick Santorum, Newt Gingrich, Herman Cain, and Buddy Romer all showed up last week. And don't forget familiar faces like Mike Huckabee, Sarah Palin, and possibly even Michelle Bachman. When all is said and done, all of these candidates are going to come right here to Iowa. It is where many presidential dreams begin and end. And evangelicals play a crucial role in all of this. Because what has to happen here is that all of these candidates have to prove their street cred with evangelicals, meeting, greeting, and talking about issues important to evangelicals. Rick Santorum has an early lead in Iowa, well, at least in the number of visits. He hopes his record of being you know, a strong defender of social uh, issues will that, resonate right. here. It's one thing to get up and give your social conservative speech and, and tell people, you know, what you believe in. It's another thing to go out and live it and lead it. In Iowa, evangelicals typically make up about 60% of caucus goers. It's about the same number in the early primary state of South Carolina. That turnout could grow even more as the Tea Party comes back for round two on the national scene. In many ways, Christian conservatives and Tea Party activists strike similar chords, including their grassroots efforts at the beginning of an election season. The people in this room are the ones who make the Iowa Faith and Freedom Coalition go. And it's those volunteers and influential voters who presidential contenders want to reach. But I love you. I love what you stand for. I want to listen to the people of Iowa. Now, America's in trouble. If you want a European secular socialist, you have a great incumbent president. We need to be a country that's turning towards God, not away from God. Each one of these candidates make their case. Some, like Herman Cain, take the direct approach. I'm a Baptist preacher. Cain is a relative unknown, but he knows how to reach this audience. When, when he first became president and he went to Turkey to give a speech and declared that we were not a Christian nation, well, I got news for the president. We are a Judeo-Christian nation, and a lot of people want to keep it that way. Newt Gingrich, on the other hand, is a familiar face. His three marriages might hurt his case with some voters. But Gingrich hopes his staunch defense of Judeo-Christian principles and his fight against radical Islam will outweigh other negatives. Our Judeo-Christian civilization is under attack from two fronts. On one front, you have a secular atheist elitism. And on the other front, you have radical Islamists. And both groups would like to eliminate our civilization if they could, for different reasons, but with equal passion. With so many candidates in the game, voters here in Iowa and around the country will have their hands full. We have a lot of homework to do, and I want to make sure that my vote is informed and the right one. They're all going to be good competitors, and we're lucky to have so many. I was just really happy to see this many people of faith here at one time gathering for all the same thing, and it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And it's no accident that audiences like this are getting together. Nationally, we built a database of over 20 million evangelical voters. Plus, the Faith and Freedom Coalition already has 400,000 members with organizations in 24 states, including the key early primary states of Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Florida. We wanted to make sure that we could have an impact on choosing the next president. And if you want to do that, you can't wait until the general election. You've got to get engaged early. And engaged they are, from the moral issues of the rising debt to abortion and traditional marriage, evangelicals will have a major impact. We're not going to be silent, we're not going to be intimidated, and we're not going to go away. We are here to stay, and we have earned our right to speak. David Brody, CBN News, in the suburbs of Des Moines, Iowa. I look at that, it's deja vu all over yeah, again. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
<laughs> you know, Terry, it was so funny in New Hampshire. Uh, all the candidates were speaking uh, to the gun group, you know, whatever the... I forget the name, whatever they call themselves, you know. The, the, Are they talking about the NRA? Or? The NRA, mm -hmm. National Rifle Association. And it, it was amazing. One would stand up and say, well, I'm a lifetime member of the NRA. And the other one would say, I used to blast birds out of the sky <laughs> every, every fall. Hunters I, unite. That's right. And I shot little rabbits and deer in the woods. And, you know, one after the other. It was just, you talk about pandering. It was unbelievable. Yeah, but that's what happens in a lot of these programs. Yeah, oh, but, but that, that uh, <laughs> National uh, Rifle Association, it was, it was something. That's a very powerful group, by the way. And. I mean, people just prostrate themselves, you know, let me, you know, I remember George Bush, well, I've, I've got a lifetime membership, you know, I've got this, <laughs> oh, please. That's, but they, that's probably but, true. But, uh, <laughs> in Iowa, the truth of it, it's a question of, of organi organizing. I mean, what you need is about 35, 40,000 people, and that isn't a whole lot. And if you got the right organization, you get them all mobilized, and you get the buses, well, and you take them the into that's the beginning. Then the money needed nowadays yeah. to participate is huge. Well, it is I later, mean. but not in a, a caucus state like Iowa. Oh, it didn't cost a lot of money. That's why an unknown can come from behind and, and do very make a, well. Make a show. And uh, I used to call that uh, Des Moines Register Pravda on the Plains. Boy, they got after me. They, they were just uh, merciless in terms of uh, hammering me, but I, I proved them wrong, and it was kind of fun. To, <laughs> but it's just a question of getting people together. I mean, it's an organizational thing, and you get 10 here and 20 there and 30 there. And uh, but the big ones, when you get the big primaries and you're talking about millions of people, that costs a lot of money because it's all television. Yeah. This is 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 yeah. you know it's, it's retail politics. A lot of handshaking. You go to meetings. I went to more. Uh, I had more cow manure on my boots. You're out there in the, with the farmers, you know, in the in the, in the stockyards and wherever. Yeah. Well, it's a long process. It's a long process, and that it can be a very painful process. Well, I, it, it was kind of fun, but know. in any event, you, you, you I, I don't wish him. You know, it's amazing. This Pawlenty is coming through strong, though. He's, you know, former governor of Minnesota. He's coming through. Uh, Rick Santorum is a great guy. These are some real fine people that are running, and we'll see who happens. But I sure hope they won't cut themselves apart and then wind up with a McCain as the candidate. That would not be a good thing. Well, coming up, a rapper reaches the pinnacle of his career. I'm seeing Diana Ross in elevated to award shows. I'm hanging with Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. It feels like, oh, now I'm, I'm accepted. So scene. how did this star wind up in a mental hospital? Find out after this. Have you ever heard the expression, good as gold? Well, gold is on everybody's minds these days, and rightfully so, having risen in value dramatically since 2001. For years now, I've been singing the praises of one of the most recognized and trusted names in gold, Swiss America. They believe, like I do, that people need to know what's good about gold. Gold has withstood the test of time, and so has Swiss America. Now's the time to rediscover gold, because gold offers diversification, profit potential, and best of all, privacy. Call or visit online now and ask for the Pat Boone DVD, and they'll gladly rush out a copy, along with other information about getting gold into your nest egg. If you're going to buy gold, Buy it from a company you can trust. I did. And I've been a satisfied Swiss America customer for over 15 years. They are as good as gold. Call or log on right now. This week on 700 Club Interactive. Well, what do you want in life? Have you ever asked yourself, what would you like to have? Well, a guy named Hans, or Hans Nelson wanted money, fame, and respect. And uh, the ticket he had to get out of where he was was something called hip-hop. But when Hans became a star, he soon found out his dreams came with a price. It's like the enemy presented an apple to me, and it looked shiny and delicious on the outside and I just wanted it and when I bit into it I didn't realize what I was biting into and I got addicted to it and the more I bit into it the more I realized it had blades and worms in it and it was killing me it was a hip-hop lifestyle and it took Hans Nelson aka Hansel 
on a trip from the top of Billboard magazine to a mental hospital into the depths of a drug addiction. The journey started when Hans was just a boy. I was biracial and because my mom was from Sweden, my dad was African American, there was a lot of stress and drama here because of that. His parents divorced when he was five, so Hans and his brother lived in Sweden with their mother for a while. But when that didn't work out, they were sent back to the States to live with their dad. I felt rejected. I pretty much just blocked things out. But I really believe a lot of that, that hurt is kind of what got me into the hip hop culture. Because hip hop can be like a cult. And it's like a family feel. It was numbing like pain in my heart. It was the pain of my past. And it was a longing for something bigger. Hans thought he'd made it when a friend got him in the door at Epic Sony. This is the label Michael Jackson's on. I'm seeing Diana Ross and Elevated to War shows. I'm hanging with Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. It feels like, oh, now I'm, re I'm accepted. But that didn't last. Sony dropped Hans. And you're like, man, you know, all this investment, this was my dream. I got kind of like a chip on my shoulder. So I, sat, I went inside with another deal with Loud RCA, which is like Wu-Tang Clan's label. But again, I got dropped. The girl I was dating with at the time, she, she kind of like broke my heart. You know, was cheating on me with somebody or something. And I felt empty. And I had been dealing with depression for a long time. Suicidal thoughts, suicide, getting a subway train, get ready to jump in front of it, just crying. Hans ended up in a mental hospital. He left after two months, but things only got worse as he moved to LA and started his own hip hop group. I had something to prove and I got really deep into drugs. I got into some really dark circles. Some, I'm talking about spheres of influence where I seen, started seeing things and I really was losing my soul. I changed so much that my stepmom looked at my, looked and said to me one day, she said, when I look in your eyes, it's like I just see the devil. Hans knew about the devil. He knew about God and Jesus too. But it wasn't until he hit rock bottom that he reached out for help. He was on a flight from St. Thomas to New York when he broke down. I had a flash of everything going through my life. I said, Lord, if you're real, just heal me. But even if you don't heal me, just take away this depression. Because I don't want to live no more. And I cried for about four hours straight. It was years of tears, pain hurt, rejection, frustration, self-inflicted stuff I did to myself through the music, through the drugs, with the women, the lifestyle I was living. I cried out to God, man, and God heard me. I got to New York City that night, and no, I can't articulate it. Then I couldn't articulate it. It's like something broke, and I knew something was different. The next day, he went to church. They asked, did anybody want to give their life to the Lord? And I said, Lord, I believe in you. Everything changed from, from night, from darkness to day. Hans left the hip hop scene with its fame and big paychecks. For a season, he took a job as a janitor to get by. He spent time reading the Bible and learned that he could trust God for everything. Hans' language changed, his focus changed, and today as a husband, a high school teacher, and a rapper, his message has changed too. One faith, one God man, one baptism, God himself. You know, at the end of the day, because there is an end of the day. Only what you do for Christ gonna last. You don't have to give in to that. I didn't know there was another side. If I'd have known what I know now, I would have did it a long time ago. God gave me a, a, a good deal. Yo, man, there's a better way. You know, Jesus is a better way. Praise God, Jesus saves. Hey, there's a better way. You know, most of you are not going to get into hip hop. It's kind of a small subculture. Uh, you got to really be good to be to do it, but most of you aren't capable, and so you, that's not something you're concerned about. But what you are concerned about is what you're trying to fill your life with. Money won't do it. Just think of the people over there in Japan. They may have been thinking about their life, their, and suddenly it's gone. Their home is gone. Some of their family may be gone. They may be facing deadly radiation. Their economy may be in shatters. I don't know what's happening, but nevertheless, it could be devastating. And it happened overnight, in a flash. There it was.
the earth opens up, the water floods in, and suddenly your whole world is changed. It can happen that fast. Are you ready if something like that happens? The only thing that's going to last is Jesus Christ. God Almighty created this earth, and he gives life to everything that's on it. And what he says to you, if you will trust me, I will be your God. I will be your Savior. I'll take you through whatever's going to happen, and I'll give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. Do you want peace? Do you want security? Do you want to know where you're going? Well, if you do, I want you to pray with me right now. And let's turn it over to Jesus. Don't fight it any longer. These words, Jesus, you are God. And I know that you died on the cross for me. But Lord, I haven't been close to you. I've been engaged in so many things that I'm ashamed of. And right now, I turn my life over to you. And I say, Lord, take me, take me, and make me your own. From this moment on, I am yours. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And for those who prayed that prayer with me, I have a little something I want to give you. You need to get started. You made a decision. Something's happened in your life. Suddenly, you say this peace. I have peace I didn't have before. Well, what does it all mean? I have a CD, 73 minutes. You can put it on a CD player. It's called A New Day, and it'll tell you what you've done or what you should be doing and what happens next. Uh, it's all here, and I'll give this to you free. I'm not, there's no financial obligation whatsoever. But I, I'd like you to call in and say, look, I prayed with Pat. I gave my heart to the Lord, and we're here because we care. It's 1-800-759-759. 0700. But we'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Stay tuned. Still ahead, 10 lessons from a former fat girl. Amy Parham weighs in on life after the biggest loser next. I was in a lot of pain. I remember feeling I don't want to have cancer. Why is this happening? I went to pray with my 10-year-old. He said that he wished he had two hearts because one of them was breaking. I had to reassure her a lot that I'm going to be okay. Things are going to be all right. You know, God's on our side. This is one thing that Cancer Treatment Center does for people. They give them the courage and the strength to battle cancer. When you first walk in that building, you almost feel like there's the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is about the patient. It is only about the patient. And what is it that they need and what do they want? Call now and we'll send you this free DVD that shows you how our very special team of experts and caregivers put you at the center of everything we do. Hope is alive at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. I don't really see how anyone can get through a life-threatening disease without the Lord in their life. He gives us the strength that we need to carry on. For this CBN news break. Democrats in the House and Senate have announced legislation to overturn the Defense of Marriage Act. DOMA, signed by President Clinton in 1996, defines marriage as between one man and one woman. Supporters of same-sex marriage want to see it overturned, and President Obama says he won't, he won't defend it in court. House Speaker John Boehner has said last week he'll launch a legal defense of DOMA. The government of Malaysia will release 35,000 Malay language Bibles held up by customs officials. Authorities block distribution of the scriptures because they, because they use the word Allah for God. Last year, a court ruling gave Christians the right to use the word Allah in their printed materials, but the government is challenging that ruling because they say it will be confusing for Muslims. The Bibles will be stamped for Christians only to prevent anyone from trying to convert Muslims. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. In the next 60 seconds, we want you to qualify to be the next $50,000 home makeover winner. 
Pick up the phone and get ready to start dialing when the number appears on your screen. Call the number on your screen now and we'll mail you a key. If your key opens the lock in your local Direct Buy Club, you'll be the next $50,000 home makeover winner. Operators are standing by, so call right now. Direct Buy Club has already awarded over a million dollars, and someone is going to win the $50,000 home makeover. Why not you? If the phone number is blinking, the phone lines are open. Call now to receive your key and an invitation to your local Direct Buy Club, where members can save thousands or more paying low direct from the source prices on big ticket items like kitchen cabinets, home furnishings, flooring, bathroom fixtures, and so much more. Call now and get your key to winning a $50,000 home makeover. Someone is going to win the $50,000 home makeover. Why not you? Growing up, Amy Parm says she was raised in the back of a Dairy Queen. By the time she was an adult, her weight ballooned to 229 pounds until she got a call from The Biggest Loser. Amy Parham went from self-described fat girl to fit girl, losing more than 100 pounds on season six of NBC's The Biggest Loser. But her weight loss process revealed deep-seated food issues she'd struggled with since childhood. We know how she lost the weight, and now in her latest book, 10 Lessons from a Former Fat Girl, Amy shares how she's kept it off. She tells us how to break unhealthy mental, emotional, and even spiritual relationships with food. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, former Biggest Loser contestant, Amy Parham. Amy, thanks for being hey, back thanks with for us. having me back. You have such an amazing story, and your book really addresses some issues that are, I think, really important for everybody to consider because food plays such an important role in our yes. culture. But before The Biggest Loser, mm -hmm. food was really a crutch for you. It was. I mean, I, I talk about in my book how, you know, we all have a hole inside of us that's really designed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet we fill it with, you know, a drink or men yes. or whatever, you know, whatever yeah. our vices. And mine happened to be ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> I totally understand that. <laughs> um, when you first started uh, to lose weight and then began working with sharing with other people how you'd been successful at doing this, you came to realize that people already had knowledge about yes. exercise, about diet. I mean, it's there are books galore yes. on shelves, mm -hmm. but they they had issues of the heart that they needed to deal with. What Absolutely. do you mean by that? Well, I know that, you know, I had been on a million diets myself in my life. I had been, you know, learned how to do the cabbage soup and the mm -hmm. Atkins and South the Beach or whatever. And, diets and, the, right. and so I talked to women all over the country and they all have a common denominator. And that is that they got their weight, they came out of control when they had some event happen in their life, whether it be a divorce or the loss of a, a loved one or whatever. And I realized that we, you know, have these events in our life and everybody has them because we all have tragedies. We mm -hmm. all have things happen. And we, you know, tend to turn to something outside of you know, God for comfort. Do you think most people are aware of what that trigger point was? I mean, are, do we live with that kind of awareness of what makes us tick? I, I don't think, but when you ask enough questions, people identify themselves. Mm -hmm. And so then they go, oh, yeah, that is what happened. In my yeah. you know, own situation, my youngest son was diagnosed with autism, and that caused me to just, you know, escape so in a bowl of ice cream. Comfort. Food was a comfort for it you was. in the midst of that, that chaos and it uncertainty. Was. You talk about how you had to overcome your own, what you call fat girl mentality. Mm -hmm. And everybody, as you said, has a different trigger, a different motivator for all of that. Right. But it's one thing to identify, like, like you might say, okay, it was the diagnosis of my son's autism. Right. But then addressing what am I going to do about this is yet another. How did you get free from that? Well, after the show, I realized that food had been my parachute because when you're in a competition, that's one thing. But then when you, you know, get into real life, you go, oh, wait a minute, you know, what am I going to do now? Yeah. And so I had to quickly retrain my thought processes, you know, find strategies and techniques that I could use. Because I, I mean, like I knew that a trigger time for me was at night when I was like mm -hmm. watching TV or relaxing. So I had to learn either foods to substitute for the unhealthy foods I had been eating, or I had to learn strategies to take myself out of that situation. And mm -hmm. so I talk about a lot of that in the book. And I also had to just really do some soul searching and, yeah. and realize 
you know, had I, do I have somebody I need to forgive? You know, do I have things inside yes. that need to be dealt yes. with? And so I talk yeah. about and, that. And that's the emotional baggage that you discuss a lot about in the book. You start the book, as you said, by saying we all have an empty place inside of us. Are most people open to that message? Well, I mean, it is, you know, I mean, it, it's the truth. I mean, I don't know if everybody's <laughs> open to it, but I mean, I really believe that we all have that place that, you know, God you know, created us with that space to, for him to, uh, to fill up. And um, he wants control of our lives. He wants control of every area of our lives. And so I feel like when we relinquish control to him, that, that those, those areas are filled. But when we try to take control ourselves, you know, then we need other things or turn to other things. Most of us, I think, at some point or another, use food to alleviate stress in our lives or, as you yes. said, to comfort ourselves in, in times of stress. What do you do to substitute for that now in your life? Well, I have found exercise to be a wonderful stress reliever. I, I, I didn't darken Were the door. Were you an exerciser before? Oh, no. <laughs> I had been in a gym maybe three times before I went to the Biggest Loser Ranch. And I'll never forget the first day seeing all the equipment. And it was like a torture chamber <laughs> to me. It scared me to death. And so, no, I never was any kind of exerciser. But, um, but now I love to go for a run or a walk. And it really helps my um, hormones be more regulated. Mm -hmm. It helps my mind to be clearer. Get rid of stress. Get, it gets yeah. rid of stress. But also, I mean, just learning things like, you know, taking a bubble bath, taking time for yourself, going to get a massage, mm -hmm. having a day for you. Because a lot of women feel guilty about doing mm -hmm. things like that because they are so, you know, conditioned to give, give, give to their family and, and to their friends. And it's really important to take care of yourself so that you're not feeling stressed all the time. And when you're time. give, give, giving, you're not having to... You know, sometimes you can't take the time to think a lot. The kind of things you're talking about make you stay in touch with what's going on in your heart and your mind. Yes, absolutely. You talk about the importance of keeping a dream journal. What is that and why is it so important? Well, I feel like sometimes people get in a rut in life and they only see their life a certain, going a certain direction. I know when I was 40 years old was when I got chosen to be on The, the Biggest Loser. And in my mind, this was the way my life was going to be the rest of my life. I was going to be overweight. I was going to have my family. I mean, I was Just settled kind of accepted in. It. Uh, I accepted it. Mm -hmm. And we encourage people when we go to speak, you know, dream about what you want your life to be. Get a new vision for your life. And, and it's important to write those dreams down. Yeah. And what's in your dream journal? I just revamped it because, I mean, this past year. <laughs> so you're still doing it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I want to go to Europe. I want to um, see my children get into a yes. good college. I mean, things yes. like that for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, she's got so much in this book. I just can't even begin to cover all of it. But, you know, if you're somebody who has yo-yoed up and down and you want to know how do I lose it and keep it off, 10 Lessons from a Former Fat Girl is a great place to start. It really causes some self-examination. What would you say you learned most about yourself? Um, I probably learned that I'm really stronger than I thought I was, mm -hmm. you know, and I think a lot of people would find that if they so look So as inside. you write that dream journal, then you realize that it has a lot more potential for fulfillment than you might have attributed to it before. Exactly. What do you think is the biggest thing that keeps people from being successful after they've lost weight? It's, I know so many people who've lost large amounts of mm -hmm. weight only to regain again. That's so discouraging. Well, I think that you... Um, are safe in your old mindset. You're safe in your old life because that's what's familiar. That's why, like, women that are abused sometimes go back to their abusers yes. or whatever. It's I because, know that. you know, mm -hmm. you just become yes. familiar with that person. And actually, my roles in my friend's life, my family's life, it completely changed after this whole process. And I do talk about that in the book, what to do after. <laughs> You're very candid in the book, and there's a lot in here for everybody. Pick up a copy of the book. It's called 10 Lessons from a Former Fat Girl. This is available in stores nationwide. And we want to say that you can watch more stories of weight loss on The Biggest Loser. It's a fascinating program. It airs Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on NBC. Thank you so much for being Thank with us for again. Thank you Pat? Very interesting. I commend her for all she's done. Folks, we're in the chat room right now, and we're waiting for your calls. We'll be taking up your questions about all sorts of things and just after a break with Bring It On. When you look in the mirror, can you imagine erasing years of aging? That's what I used to look like. Lifestyle Lift takes only about an hour. See the difference immediately. I'm Linda. 
I'm 70 years old. Can you believe it? Call now for a free information kit. It's quick, affordable, and takes only about an hour. Lifestyle Lift, a breakthrough medical procedure that helps remove wrinkles, frown lines, and sagging skin. Call now for a free information kit. Consultations are free. Call Lifestyle Lift today. Do you take fish oil? There's an omega-3 supplement that's better than regular fish oil. Staying healthy, it's not easy. I exercise regularly and eat lots of fruits and vegetables. I used to take a fish oil supplement too, but then I discovered something better than regular fish oil. Arctic Wonder Omega-3 Krill Oil. It's from the makers of One A Day, so I know I can trust it. The Omega-3s in Arctic Wonder both support heart health and are scientifically proven to be better absorbed than regular fish oil. You'd have to take six of these fish oil soft gels to get the strength of just two Arctic Wonder soft gels. The Arctic Wonder does not have an aftertaste. They go down real easy. Arctic Wonder isn't just good for your heart. It also supports healthy brain function and a healthy immune system. This is one of the products that I plan to take for the rest of my life. Arctic Wonder is from One A Day and not available in stores. For a special trial offer, call or go online now. Call 1-800-409-7339. That's 1-800-409-7339. Or go online to tryarcticwonder.com now. Tomorrow, from a former Soviet gulag, a prison camp prayer. Today, we are seeing the fruits of their prayers. That's changing a nation. These tribes were once forgotten, not anymore. Plus, he's one of the most popular chefs in the country who started some of the most popular restaurants in the world. Rick Tremonto shows you how to get a five-star meal at home tomorrow on The 700 Club. Well, many of you have sub submitted questions online for us today. And, Pat, this first one is from Sean obviously Irish there, who says, it's St. Patty's Day. Why aren't you wearing green? Sean, I am covered with shame. I forgot. <laughs> I really did. I did, too. I'm, yeah. I'm really. I mean, they they made a whole day named after me, and what do I do? <laughs> I was in Chicago. You know, they turned the whole uh, thing green. They poured green stuff into That's the... Right. Into it was the, all for you. Yeah, it was all for me. And I think they're having parades in my honor and everything. They are, and I, here you sit. So I'm filled with shame, Patty. Thank you for that reminder. But yes, St. Patrick, a great man. Yes, indeed. All this right. is Jacqueline who says, I think my neighbor is a pizza. Tom, my husband and I have caught him watching us go in and out of our house. It's pretty creepy. What can I do? Uh, well, you could. There's one thing I learned about in law school. There's one principle in tort law that they say you learn that, and that is you can't set spring guns against poachers. <laughs> So I was thinking you could set up a gun to, to get him, but then I was thinking, no, Too much NRA talk no, today. you can't do that. You can't, you can't shock no, him. How about just waving and smiling and getting to know him? He might just be a lonely dude who, no. Okay. Well, if all he's doing is watching you go in and out of your garage, that isn't exactly peeping Tom. It's when he's watching you going in and out of the shower that's a different matter. <laughs> yes. uh, but I mean, I just think I. But I think what nosy. Terry says is right. He waves, say, "Hey, how are you?" Yeah. Maybe he's lonely. Okay, this is Kim who wants to know: Is it a sin to live with my boyfriend even if we're not sexually active? Oh. Um, I think you should flee youthful lust. That's what the Bible says, flee. I mean, you, you're living with your boyfriend. I mean, come on. It also says flee the appearance of sin. Well, you know, the appearance, that's not a good translation. I was going to no. do that, except that's, that's, that the Greek doesn't say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. it, it says flee every form of it. And not the, the appearance is, is, is a bad translation. But nevertheless, uh, flee youthful lust. You, you just shouldn't be doing it. Why don't you get married? I mean, if you like him that much, get married. You, you're living together, mm -hmm. and you're doing all that, and, but you're not having sex? Yes. That doesn't make any sense. All right. I, I agree with that. Well, Robert sent us this question via email, and he says, The other day I saw a guy on the street carrying around a repent sinner sign. He said that everyone was going to hell, and he was yelling at people who were yelling back at him. As a Christian, I was offended. I thought he was a poor representative of Christ. Should I have confronted him, or was he right for acting the way he did? No, these guys, really, they have deep-seated emotional problems. And they probably haven't really surrendered to the Lord. And so in order to overcome what is a sense of guilt in their life, they've got a big sign that said, look, I hold a sign up telling people to repent. 
chances are he's the one. You find a preacher preaching about adultery all the time, and before long you realize he's the guy that's doing it. I mean, you know, and but I think he's I, preaching against his own temptation. Yeah. I, I really think that's what we're, we're dealing with here, but I, I, I do not, that's not the way to win people to the Lord, and it's, 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 it's a disgrace, but hey, should you confront him? What are you going to tell he him? He probably wouldn't receive it of anyway. Of course he would. I mean, somebody I mean, of who does not. that isn't exactly what? open. Okay, this is Christina who says, <laughs> does God love the devil? Uh, I really can't tell you who, who God loves, but uh, the devil is a rebel, and uh, he has, uh, he was the anointed cherub that covered the very holiness of God. He walked in the stones of fire. He was right there, and he says, I am going to take heaven away from God, and I'm going to do better than he could. That's the first sin. Does God love him? I, I think God loves everybody. It probably grieves God that the highest of his creation turned away from him, but that does not spare the devil from the fact he's going to the depths of hell. This is Lisa who wants to know, how can I get rid of a generational curse? Well, at least you've got to be sure you know what you're talking about. Uh, but uh, I would go back uh, through the generations, if you think that's what it is, and you renounce every one of them, and you find out if indeed um, they were killing people or they were practicing witchcraft or whatever, then, you know, denounce what it is you think they were doing and ask for cleansing all the way through. You may need other people working with you on that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it all by yourself. Okay, this is Ruby who asks, I have a friend who says she is both a Christian and a Hindu. Is this possible? She says she accepted Christ as her Savior, but I'm still perplexed. Uh, in the Hindu religion, as I understand it, there are 300 million gods. They have all kinds of gods, and so they can add another god without any trouble at all. Uh, god doesn't share his glory with anybody. I mean, he is Lord of lords and King of kings. We had a story earlier about that Malay Bible calling uh, God Allah. Allah, yeah, Allah a is a, a specific name of a particular deity. The God we serve is named Yahweh or Yehovah. He has a name. I am, and God isn't, you know, so when you see, watch this carefully, when you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is a translation of the Hebrew Yahweh. His name is not Lord. His name is Jehovah or Yahweh. Got something else? This is from uh, Deborah, who says, My sister is single and financially unstable. She wastes money all the time. Still, she expects me and the rest of our family to subsidize her lifestyle. She cites 1 Timothy 5, uh, 8, which says that anyone who does not provide for their relatives is worse than an unbeliever. Am I wrong for refusing to give her money? Does that make me worse than an unbeliever? No, of course not. You're, you're not to uh, 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 care for their own. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure what kind of a relative he is, but you're talking about your immediate family. A sister. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, you're not supposed to take care of your sister. I mean, she's I mean, if she's sick, she's in trouble, you help her. But, you, you know, you, if you really love her, uh, you're going to make her face up to the fact that she's sinning against God. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care of it. <laughs> That's all the time we've got, I guess. Thanks for those questions. I, I hope I'm answering and helping you a little bit. Well, we leave you with these words from a great verse in the Bible, Jeremiah 33, 6. I will heal my people and will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. That's what we want, peace and prosperity, peace and security. That's in the hearts of everybody. Well, we'll see you at this same time tomorrow. At least Gordon will be here tomorrow, so don't miss it. See you then. Here at CBN, we see amazing things happen when we stand together. That's why we want to say thank you to the thousands of you who recently pledged to join the 700 Club. Your monthly gift makes it possible to bring crucial help to those who need it most. You help heal the sick, feed the hungry, and preach the gospel across America and throughout the world. You've brought health and hope to people in desperate need. And changed their lives forever. Just like you did for Samuel, who developed a skin rash that spread into ulcers all over his little body. The nearest clinic, a two-hour bus ride away, couldn't help Samuel. That's when you sent a medical team to his village. He received the medicines and care he needed to save his life. 
you were the answer to this family's prayers. So please, watch for this mailing and send in your pledge. This year, millions will know the love and saving power of Jesus Christ. And that only happens because you were there.